Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's really good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here today. My name is David Emmer, and I'm one of the pastors here at Celebration. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a season. We finally are here. Uh, each year now, for the last three years here at Celebration, uh, we've done this thing called Season of Compassion. And it starts today, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and it runs until the Sunday before Christmas. And let me just tell you what we're doing. Uh, we're sort of drafting off of the reality that at this time of year, for some reason, virtually every single one of us has a sort of a heightened sense of caring about our neighbor, about people who live near us. You know, we want to make sure that people at Christmas have gifts to exchange, and at Thanksgiving, people have a meal to share. We, we want to make sure that those things happen, and we want to go through great lengths to make sure it occurs. So over the years, as we've sort of seen that, we thought, well, what if we just said, hey, we're going to take those five or six weeks, and we're going to sort of latch on to them, and we're going to use them to just propel us forward in our caring for other people. And so that's where Season of Compassion came from, and it all begins today. So let me just tell you what's going on already over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, a couple hundred of you picked up shopping lists to buy groceries so that we can deliver them uh, today to families in need all over uh, Tallahassee. Uh, we're going to be serving 250 families uh, this year family, for Family Night of Thanksgiving, and that equals 1,250 people that we're going to be providing Thanksgiving dinner for. Now, if, you know, hopefully all of you already have done your shopping for Family Night Thanksgiving. Yesterday, uh, I'm, we're, my wife and I are at home. It's about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and I look at Pam, and I said, hey, did you get a shopping list? Uh, most years we do, but not every year. Sometimes people have snapped them up before we can get to one. And so I did not know if Pam had gotten a shopping list for family night Thanksgiving or not. So yesterday about 1 o'clock, did you get a shopping list? She said, no, I didn't get a shopping list. Okay, no problem. That night, last night, about 11 o'clock, Pam goes, oh no, I forgot to do the family night Thanksgiving shopping. I said, I asked you about that at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, that's what you meant by shopping list. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Hopefully, she's, she's shopping right now. She goes to the third service, in case you, you're curious. That's how she rolls, okay? <laughs> Not a morning person, so third service for her. And it's going to break in her favor. I need to stop throwing my wife under the bus. <laughs> yeah, no more of that. Anyway, hopefully you've already done that. So today, those are going to be packed up at, uh, let's see, 2 o'clock this afternoon. They're going to be available for delivery. So if you signed up to deliver, uh, that's when you start. And we'll be delivering those things all over town. And uh, it's going to be great. And then tomorrow, we have a partnership with local law enforcement. They're going to be wrapping up any undelivered items that we, we haven't gotten out of there. Uh, also, we're providing uh, Christmas gifts for 325 kids this year. Uh, for foster kids, kids who have family members who are incarcerated. Um, if you want to be involved in that, I think we still have a few left. You can pick up the little gift tags out there. Another thing that's going on is we're adopting families. We've been doing this for a couple of years, but this year I'm particularly excited about it. You may not be aware of it, but here in Tallahassee, there is a small Congolese refugee community that's been kind of settled here in Tallahassee. And so we're going to be adopting people from that community this year. I just want you to stop and think what it would be like to leave your own home area, your own home country, and be dropped into another country with a totally different language, totally different way of doing things. Think about how disconcerting that would be, and think about how valuable it would be for you if a local family came alongside and just sort of adopted you. And so that's what's going on with Adopt a Family. I think we've still got a family or two that's available for that if you want to be a part of that. So jump on in there and, and be a part of that. Every year, the women here at Celebration sponsor a brunch during our Christmas season. Tickets are available right now. And the proceeds from that brunch always go to support ministries that are near and dear to the hearts of the women in our church. So this year, we're going to be supporting the Women's Pregnancy Center and also the Making Miracles Group Home. So you can be a part of that. Buy those tickets. Be a part of that brunch. 
Something new this year, uh, we are going to be going, we're sending teams out to go and serve in assisted living centers all across our city over the month of December. And I'm happy to tell you, all of those volunteer spots have already been taken. So good job for getting involved and, and making that happen. And one more uh, for you. We do something every year as a part of Season of Compassion called the Star Project. This is a $20,000 project, and we invest it into local ministry. So last year, we invested it into the resource center for the Florida Baptist Children's Home so that foster families could go there, get clothing and other things they need, car seats, what have you, uh, for kids that are in foster care in their home. This year, we're taking that same gift, that $20,000, and we're investing it into three different church plants uh, here in Leon County and in Gadsden County. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to be inviting you to be a part of volunteering to serve alongside of these brand new church plants. It's pretty exciting stuff, especially if you're a church junkie like I am. So just want to let you all know what's going on. Now, why are we doing this? What's the point? Why do we do all of this? Why do we spend tens of thousands of dollars serving our local community? There are government programs out there feeding people. There's, you know, why do we do this? Why do we divert hundreds of hours, maybe thousands of hours of volunteer energy into this? Why? There's an amazing story in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15. If you've got a Bible, open it to Luke 15. There's a Bible in the row in front of you beneath the seat. You can use that one. Follow along in your app, whatever you want to do there. But in Luke 15, there's an amazing story there. Jesus has been invited into, let me just give you the background. Go ahead and open to Luke 15. As you're finding Luke 15, Jesus has been invited into the home of a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee was a religious leader of the Jewish religion back in the days of Jesus. And these were people of tremendous influence and, frankly, of power. If you got crosswise with one of these people, it could go very, very badly for you, okay? And the Pharisees were not necessarily Jesus' biggest fans. They were not in agreement with a lot of what he was teaching. But one of them invites Jesus to come to his home for a meal, and Jesus is happy to oblige. So he tends the meal, and as he's leaving, Jesus is met at the door by a crowd of people. During this season of Jesus' ministry, huge crowds are following him everywhere he goes and there's this crowd of people waiting for him at the door as he leaves this pharisee's home and this crowd well let's just say that the religious leaders weren't exactly happy with the people who were standing there waiting for jesus to walk out the door luke 15 verses 1 and 2 here we are all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. All right, now I want you to look at the way that Luke describes this crowd of people coming to Jesus. He says they are tax collectors and they are sinners. How many of you all love it when the IRS gives you a phone call, sends you a letter, comes to your door, right? I told you all before, years ago, I had a friend of mine. He was an investigator for the IRS. His name was Cy Fungi. you got to love the name. He was a forensic accountant for the IRS. I don't know what a forensic accountant does. I just don't want one coming after me. Cy's the only accountant that I know that carried a gun and a badge. I asked him one time, Cy, what do you need a gun for? You work for the IRS. He said, I need a gun because I work for the IRS. Okay, it was one of those self-explanatory things, right? In this day, the tax collector worked for the Roman government, an occupying government. They were seen as traitors. They were Jews who turned their back on their own people and were collecting money for them. These were not people that you liked. And then the next group, sinners. Isn't that just a nice label? How would you like to be on a baseball team and on your jersey it just said, the sinners? There you go. Nobody wants to be on that team. The sinners were the kids who were always in trouble at home. Then they went to school. They were always in trouble at school. They were always in the principal's office. And then when they got to be adults, they didn't get over it. Those were the sinners. And if they were the sinners, then the Pharisees were the teacher's pets, okay? They were the exact opposite. So Jesus looks at this group of people. 
He's got tax collectors. He's got sinners. Then over here, he's got the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and he sees them, and he knows what the religious leaders are thinking, all right? He's dialed in, sees what's going on in their mind. They're thinking, why is he with those people? That's what they're thinking. So he tells the religious leaders three different short stories. The first one is a story about a lost sheep. The second one is a story about a lost coin. And the third one is a story about a lost son. That last one is a, maybe the most famous story that Jesus ever told. We call it the story of the prodigal son, right? We actually looked at the prodigal son uh, last year. If you want to know more about that story, go to our website, go to the videos, and you can dig that one out. Today, I want us to look at the first two stories, okay? The story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin. Now, as we look at these two stories, you're going to notice they have, there's a pattern at work in both of these stories, okay? So be looking for the pattern. Let's take a look at Luke 15, beginning in verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man among you has 100 sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Or what woman who has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her women friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you in the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. All right, so as you look at these stories, do you see the pattern? Do you see the pattern that emerges from the stories? Well, in both of these two stories, it begins by telling us about something that's become lost, right? So the first one, there's a man, he's got 100 sheep. One of those sheep's sheep becomes lost. Then in the next story, there's a woman, she's got 10 silver coins, and that's about two weeks' pay, in case you're curious, and she loses one of those coins, okay? Something gets lost in both of the stories. In both of the stories, what that thing that gets lost is of tremendous value, right? You see it, the sheep really matters to the shepherd. The coin really matters to the woman. It's vital that the missing item be found. Then in both stories, there's an all-out search, right? The first one, the shepherd, I assume, looks at his other shepherds who are with him. He says, hey, you all watch these sheep. I got to go. I got to go back into the wilderness. I got to find this one sheep that's missing. And an all-out search takes place. He looks everywhere to find the one sheep that's lost. Same thing for the woman, right? She lost this silver coin, one-tenth of what she has, two weeks' pay, that's a lot of money, right? You would look for that coin, wouldn't you? I would. And she goes out on an all-out search. She grabs a flashlight. She's looking under all the furniture, right? She gets a broom out. She sweeps the floor. Maybe she'll hear it rattling across the floor as it, it goes by, caught by the broom. She goes on an all-out search, and nothing is going to stop her from finding this coin. Why? Why are we looking for this sheep so hard, right? You got 99 more. What's one sheep? Why are we looking so hard for this coin? You got nine more. In both stories, that which is lost matters greatly. Then in both stories, when the lost item is found, there's a huge party. I love parties. Parties are fun. There's going to be a big party on Thursday, right? Thanksgiving. It's a huge party. It's the one time of the year that no matter what your waistline looks like, people tell you to just keep on eating. That's a wonderful day, right? What a great day. In both of these stories, when the lost item is found, there's a huge party. What happens with the shepherd? The shepherd calls all of his shepherd buddies together. He throws the sheep on top of its shoulder, and he walks. The sheep's got legs. The sheep could walk. 
He throws the sheep on top of his shoulders and he walks from the wilderness back to where the other shepherds are. As I envisioned this in my mind, I thought about the people, the women that I see who carry a dog in their purse. I do not understand this. (laughs) Dog's got four legs. You've got two. The dog can walk. Okay, but no, it's in the purse. The guy throws the sheep onto his shoulders. The sheep could walk. But this is too big of a party to let this sheep walk. And he goes back to the other shepherds and he says, let's celebrate. I found the missing sheep. What does the woman do? The woman contacts all of her women friends, the Bible says. In our day, what would she do? She would be hopping onto Facebook, telling everybody, I found the coin. Hashtag party time. (laughs) Right? Huge deal, this coin. One-tenth of all I had has been found. Why the party? Why the search? Because that which was missing matters greatly. Then Jesus draws it all to a conclusion. He says, hey, listen, I want you to understand, their joy compares to the joy of heaven when just one person goes from being lost, that is far from God, to being found, which is near to God. And the implication is clear. That lost person matters greatly to God. And he's going on an all-out search to find that lost person. The Bible tells us that every single one of us matters greatly to God. Look at 1 Timothy. It says that God wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Every single person. And God isn't passive on this. You might be thinking, how does God go on an all-out search looking for people who are lost, who are far from Him? Hey, we're about to celebrate God's all-out search. It's coming up in just a few weeks. That's what Christmas is all about, right? God is not passive in our lostness. He's actively working to save the lost. So He sends His Son, Jesus, who by God's power is born to a young virgin named Mary. And he sends angels to announce his coming, his arrival to shepherds. Then Jesus travels from city to city, announcing that the kingdom of God is at hand. He pulls together a group of men called disciples, and he sends those disciples out on a mission to tell everybody who will listen to them all about the kingdom of God. Then Jesus pays the penalty for our sin on the cross so that our debt can be canceled. And then to destroy the power of sin and death, Jesus raises from the tomb, right? Incredible stuff. Then he gathers the church together, gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then sends them to spread the gospel all over the world. Think about it this way. God is so serious about his search for you and for me that he triggered a global movement called the church just to find us. You matter to God. When you came to Jesus, it mattered so greatly that there was a party in heaven. As I thought about this story and about that particular idea, I couldn't help but think about um, my own parents. My mom and dad both passed away when I was quite young. They loved the Lord with all of their heart. I'm totally confident they're in heaven with the Lord right now, and I am looking forward to that reunion with them. I really, really am. As I was thinking about this whole idea of a party, I thought about my wife, okay? When uh, I first met Pam, she had been a Christian for less than a week. She met Jesus right before she met me in God's providential timing. She'd not yet been baptized. She was a brand new believer in Jesus Christ. And I can't imagine that my mom and dad weren't in heaven when knowing that Pam is going to be my wife, knowing that she just gave her life to Christ, and they were there celebrating. They were there at the party. I was here on earth partying at her baptism. My wife was raised Catholic. She'd never seen a baptism by immersion before, okay? So the first one she ever sees is the one that she participates in. So we're at church one Sunday, and the guy that's going to do the baptism, uh, do Pam's baptism, is a wonderful friend of ours. And so he's talking to Pam. says, okay, you know, when you get baptized, you're going to need to bring these clothes. You know, you're going to get wet and all this kind of stuff. And then she says, well, what's going to happen during the baptism? How does it work? He said, well, you and I will get into this tank filled with water, okay, it'll be about this deep, and then, you know, I will baptize you, I'll lay you back in the water, and I'll hold you 
under the water ever so briefly. And he said, while I'm holding you under, I'll recite the Lord's Prayer. (laughs) And he said, I've been practicing because I don't want to mess it up and have to start over while I've still got you held under. (laughs) Pam's eyes were like, what? You know? That's, that's not what happens. If you've never seen a baptism, it was all just in good fun. We had a party on this side. I can't imagine that on the heaven side, there wasn't a huge party when my wife gave her life to Christ. I can't imagine that my mom and dad weren't celebrating when my son and my daughter gave their life to Christ. Don't you know there was a huge party? And I just want you to know that for you, if you're a Christ follower, in this room today, when you accepted Christ, there was a huge party in heaven. It's a holiday. Pam um, was recently working over at Fresh Start, and she had the privilege of leading a young woman to Christ. And she told the young woman, she said, I want you to write the date down, write down today's date, someplace where you won't lose it. The lady said, why? She said, because this is the day that you accepted Christ. This is the day that you went from being lost to being found. There's a party in heaven on this day. And there'll be a day when you'll wonder if you really made that decision. And you can look back at that date and be reminded that's the day that it all started. And I just want you to know, if you're here today and you aren't in a relationship with Christ, if you've never told Jesus that you want to receive his payment for your sin, and if you haven't yet invited him to lead you and guide your life, I want you to know God is actively seeking you. He's been on an all-out search, and he wants you to go from being lost to being found. Why? Because you matter greatly to God. That's why. Okay? Now, when we as a church began to understand that the lost matter greatly to God, it began to shape the way that things happen. I mean, in fact, uh, the celebration started, we're going to be having the 40th anniversary of our church in about two years. We were, we were already starting talking about it, starting to do a little, little party planning for the 40th anniversary of celebration. So nearly 40 years ago, there were a group of people who saw this brand new subdivision that was going to be built on the north side of Tallahassee, out in the boondocks. Some of you all remember that. Out in the middle of nowhere, this subdivision was going to be built, right? And for some reason, we're going to give it all of these Irish names. I don't know if there were a lot of Irish people around, but for some reason, we're going to call it Killarn, and everything about it is going to be like named by redheads, and, uh, and it's going to have this real Irish vibe to it, right? You all know what I'm talking about. And so what drove the foundation of celebration was the fact that there was this heart for the lost. And the people that started this church recognized that God has a heart for lost people and that we as a church ought to have a heart for lost people too. And so over the years, nearly 40 years now, all kinds of ministry has been done, uh, you know, preaching the gospel, right? Uh, Blast, Blast Junior, student ministry, after school, weekday preschool, upward basketball. We could just go on and on and on. All of this ministry that's driven by what? A heart for the lost because we know that God cares deeply for the lost okay they're just in his heart then as time went by and we kept sort of learning more and more about God and about his heart we began to realize that God has a heart for the nations okay and that this is really important to God in fact Mark 11 verse 17 says my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations that idea very very important to God right and so what did we do We started sending teams from Celebration to go and to serve all around the world. We send, we've got a team headed to Ethiopia. In fact, we're going to be uh, commissioning them to go to Ethiopia next Sunday. All right, so they're going to, just before Christmas, they're taking off heading to Ethiopia to serve. We've got teams that are going to be headed to uh, Colombia in the coming months to serve Venezuelan refugees. We just sent a medical team to Cambodia. We sent a team this summer to go and do evangelism in North Africa. Okay, so we got all these teams going out because we realize that God has a heart for the nations. Then we began to, a couple of years ago, when we got ready to start Season of Compassion, We started looking around here in Tallahassee, and we realized 
that there wasn't a person in this city that God doesn't love. Would you all agree with that? There's not a person in this city that God does not care deeply about. There's not a person in the city that God isn't actively seeking. He's on all-out search for that which is lost, right? And we realize, man, we've got to develop a, a, a heart for the people right here in our own community. And we began to realize God doesn't just care for them spiritually, does he? It's more than that. God cares about their physical welfare too. There's a great piece of scripture and Jesus is talking about judgment and he's talking about how a real Christ follower can be identified. This is what Jesus says about a real Christ follower. Matthew 25, verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. So Jesus says that caring for the physical needs of those around us is an absolutely mission-critical part of what it means to be a Christ follower. And so that led us to Season of Compassion, and it all started with Family Night of Thanksgiving. And we said, God, we want you to expand our heart for the hungry the same way that your heart, the way that you care about the hungry. Now, I want you all to know, for years now, if someone comes to our door, and they tell us they're hungry, we give them something to eat. We've been doing that for years. But a couple of years ago, we started the Family Night of Thanksgiving. And as I just told you, this year we have the privilege of feeding 1,250 people at Thanksgiving. It's just a way to sort of jumpstart our heart into caring for something that God has a huge heart for, which is the hungry. In addition to that, we said, you know what? God cares greatly about the needs of of foster kids. He cares about the fatherless. And so if we're going to have God's heart, that's something that we need to care about as well. And so we, for years, long before I ever got here, we were buying Christmas gifts for foster kids. Now we do that in an even larger way with Season of Compassion. Last year, as a part of Season of Compassion, we outfitted something called the Resource Center at Florida Baptist Children's Home so that all foster families would have a place where they could go and get clothes and uh, formula and car seats and all that they needed to take care of those foster kids. That's just something that's on our heart because we believe that God cares about foster kids and we ought to care too. So as we kept going in this thing, we said, well, the Bible tells us that God has a heart for the prisoner. And so we added to that whole idea of gifts for kids. We added kids who are a part of families where someone is incarcerated. We thought that's a way that we can share God's heart for the prisoner. We can go and we can serve there. Then we began to think about the refugee. Years ago, uh, in something we call our Lottie Moon Missions Offering, we started pointing that offering directly at the needs of refugees in the country of Yemen. We've been doing that for a number of years, and our church is one of the leading givers in the nation in coming along and ministering to refugees in the country of Yemen. And so we got this idea, well, are there any refugees here in our community? And we discovered this Congolese group that's, that's been located here in Tallahassee, and we said, well, surely there's a way that we can develop a heart for those people and so we started aiming our uh, adopt-a-family or family-to-family -family ministry at them. And one of the church plants that we're kind of working with right now is a brand-new Congolese church here in Tallahassee. They speak Swahili in their worship service, and we get to come alongside them and encourage them and help them develop their leadership and, and help them to get going. And we said, well, what about our senior adults? For years, our deacons have been adopting our seniors here it is, our senior adults. And, but what if we did more there? What if we did something to kind of see our heart expand in this area? And so this year we started sending teams. This year during Season of Compassion, we're sending teams to assisted living centers all over town during the month of December to minister to them and have a Christmas party with them, do something to let them know that we care. For years now, our deacons have been adopting all of our widows here at Celebration to make sure that they've got the support they need. But we just feel like, hey, if we're, we're going to have to join God's heart here. And then we said, well, what about church planting? I mean, I love my church here at Celebration. Hopefully you love your church too. Wouldn't it be great if other people 
had a church that they could love in their own community, or maybe it worships in their own language, wouldn't it be important for them to have an access to their church? So we got excited and said, hey, Lord, expand our heart about church planting. See, here's the thing I want you to understand. It doesn't matter who someone is. It doesn't matter what skin tone they have. It doesn't matter where they're born. It doesn't matter if they live on the north side or on the south side of Tallahassee. None of that makes any difference. All of them matter to God, every single one of them. And God is calling us to expand our heart, right? To expand our heart so that it looks like his heart. That's what he's calling us to do. He's calling on you and me to care about people who are at great risk. Whether they're refugees, whether they're people who don't have quite enough food to eat, whether it's kids who are growing up in really troubled homes, God wants us to develop and expand our heart so that our heart looks like his heart, right? That's the whole thing. So today, what's going on here? Celebration. Today we're taking a collective step. You got it? That's what Season of Compassion is all about. We're taking a collective step in sharing God's heart for people. And maybe for you, that step is to get a gift tag for a kid who would really benefit and be really blessed with a Christmas gift this year. And maybe yours is you're going to be serving today. You're going to be delivering meals to somebody's home this afternoon. Maybe you're going to be packing turkeys over in the gym. You're one of our turkey packers. You're going to be serving. And you're going to get the chance maybe to go out and make deliveries all over the city of Tallahassee. The family that's really in need. And for most of you, those deliveries are going to go great. Some of you are probably going to get frustrated. The person that you deliver to isn't at home, even though we called and checked and made sure and told them what time you are going to be there. They're not there. Or something else goes wrong. There's a setback. You couldn't find their house to begin with because of where they live in our community. That'll happen. But for most of you, you'll make that delivery. You'll have that chance to connect with that family. And when you connect with that family, I want you to remind yourself, they matter deeply to God. Maybe you pray with them. Maybe you invite them to come back to at 6 o'clock tonight here for family night at Thanksgiving. Shouldn't we be praying and thanking God at Thanksgiving? So we're going to come together tonight at 6 o'clock. Have a big prayer time together. It's a lot of fun. It's family friendly. Be here tonight at 6 o'clock. And we'll celebrate the fact that God expanded our heart a little bit. Some of you, maybe you can adopt a refugee family. And I got to tell you, it's not cheap. It's expensive. It takes time. But for some of you, God is working to expand your heart in this way. Maybe it's to come alongside of a brand new church plant. Totally something completely different for you. You never thought you'd do something like that. In a couple of weeks, you're going to volunteer. God's going to expand your heart. That's what we're doing, right? Because we want our heart to look like God's heart. Hey, one more thing. God cares tremendously about you. He absolutely does. He loves you in spite of your history. He loves you in spite of the detours. He loves you, and he is on an all-out search to find you. And so right now, some of you all need to respond to that search. You need to say, God, I know that you've been searching for me. Here I am. I'm ready to go from being lost to being found. I want to be a part of your family. Thank you for caring about me that's you today, man, meet me out at Fresh Start as soon as we're done here. And let's talk about what it looks like to be a part of God's family. So there's a lot for you to do today, right? A lot for you to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for involving us in things that are so important to you, so critical to you, so vital to you. And so, Lord, we pray that we see you work in all of these activities that we're doing, not just so that we can do a good thing, but so that our heart can be expanded, so that our heart can look like your heart. Father, we pray for those who are in this room right now, 
those people who are not a part of your family, they're still lost. We don't like to think of ourselves as that way, but man, it's so healthy to embrace that reality if that's where we are. And I pray that today's the day they say, you know what? I want my party in heaven to happen today. I'm going to go from being lost to being found. Help them, Father, to do that very thing. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.